All right, broadcasting once again from our secluded bunker on the west bank of the Halifax River. You call it the COVID castle. I call it home. Here we are, I'm your pandemic professor, Scott Velasco. And the last time you saw me, we were talking about the very earliest days of audio recording, that proto era where we had what we called acoustic recording, recording without microphones. We went through four devices made by four men that all functioned on very similar principles. But then at the end of that last video, we listened to the gramophone. And it probably had this effect on you where it almost feels like, like haunted house music to us. You know, it's that scratchy, faint sort of high frequency, tinny sound that to us just kind of sounds spooky, right? But something changed. Right around the 1920s, there is suddenly a dramatic improvement in the quality of the recordings that are being made. And today we're going to get into what we call electric recording. What was that change? Well, the change, it turns out, came in the form of a piece of technology that was being manufactured at a place called Western Electric. We had a guy named Orlando Marsh working at this time, and this would have been the mid-1920s. And Marsh was working with a new technology that looks like this. This that you are seeing right here is the vacuum tube. But the vacuum tube is a means to modulate electricity. And the way Marsh was, was determined to modulate electricity was to amplify the signal. Now, this is really good for us because what you have to understand is until this point, Remember, we said we weren't using microphones in recording. We were just making noise into that big cone, right? And it was funneling the air pressure down to the diaphragm. Microphones were around, though. The microphone was invented the same year as the phonograph. Talk about a banner year for audio, 1877. And incidentally, the microphone was invented by a guy who showed up again, Emil Berliner, creating the gramophone much later. But the problem with the microphone is that it has a very tiny amount of electrical output. And what we need in order to scratch that groove is a much stronger energy. So back at Western Electric, Orlando Marsh was figuring out how to take the vacuum tube and amplify the output of an electrical signal. Suddenly, the microphone was a useful tool in recording because not only could the signal be amplified strong enough to help us cut the groove, but microphones were going to be able to record far more sensitive differences in the frequency of the sound wave. And so now we had a greater frequency range and we had a greater dynamic range. You remember what those two things mean. Frequency range we think of maybe as pitch from low to high. Dynamic range we think of as loud to soft, right? So the introduction of quality amplification by Orlando Marsh really makes the microphone a usable tool in recording, which really makes our recordings sound much, much better. So now that we had a better input device, the microphone, we still needed a better medium, a better recording device. And there had been a lot of ideas on this leading up to the introduction of, of the microphone in recording. In fact, one of the earliest comes from this fella Oberlin Smith. And Oberlin Smith, back in 1888, had an idea about magnetic recording. Now, he never actually made a device, but his concept was that you could take the output of a microphone, which is an alternating current of electricity, and somehow use that to displace metallic shavings on what he thought of as a thread. So Oberlin Smith is talking about using this thread coated in metallic shavings, and then the output of the microphone sort of 
moves those shavings around. Lower frequencies move those shavings in a wider pattern. Higher frequencies move those shavings in a narrower pattern. And that was his concept. And he didn't actually build the device, but it didn't take long before someone tried to. And here we have Vladimir Poulsen. And about 10 years after Smith published his idea, Vladimir Poulsen had a working prototype for what was called the wire recorder. And the wire recorder was essentially just what uh, Oberlin Smith was writing about, except instead of a thread, it was a wire. But there was a magnetic head, and the magnetic impulse of that head was fluctuated by the output of the microphone. And therefore, we were recording not the acoustic sound wave, but the electric wave that mirrored the properties of the sound wave. So Vladimir Poulsen creates the prototype and it works. It doesn't sound great. It really doesn't because again, this is all before we have the proper amplification. But about 20 years after all of this, we get Orlando Marsh at Western Electric and the vacuum tube. And this suddenly becomes a usable device. And it remains a usable device all the way through, I mean, really through World War II. Okay, so let's talk about what's going on in the U.S. musically here. You remember in one of our last videos, I said there's a change in technology and it will change the kind of music we make? As soon as we had that four-minute time limit on a cylinder, we had to start writing songs that fit into a four-minute time span, right? There's one of our first examples. But then... Another great change happens in, in technology, and it changes the kind of music we make again. We get a new type of microphone. Up until then, the microphones that we had been using were being used for telephone, and they weren't very sensitive. They were designed to be held right up against your mouth, and you had to make a lot of noise. They are actually similar to, like, a CB radio microphone, if you can imagine that. But in the 1920s, we suddenly get this new type of mic called a ribbon microphone. And the ribbon microphone gives us the ability to make very faint, faint fluctuations in air pressure that will be accurately recorded. Because it's just this slim, slender, microns thin ribbon that is fluttering back and forth when you make noise into it. So, the ribbon microphone suddenly changes the type of voices that can be heard. Now, we still don't have amplification because, again, this is still like early 20s that we're talking about. And the output of a ribbon microphone is very weak. So, it couldn't move the needle to cut the groove, but it could be broadcast live over radio, which was the primary form of entertainment at this time. And so, we start to see different radio stars. And here's one of them. We've got Bing Crosby. So Bing Crosby had this deep, velvety baritone. You know him from White Christmas, right? But he was, at the time, one of the biggest stars in the world, one of the biggest entertainers in the world. And prior to the ribbon microphone, if your voice was going to be heard, you had to really project. You had to make these big loud sounds. So the voices who were most popular, the singers who rose to fame, were the ones who could be heard best in the recordings and in the broadcast. That means for guys, you had these nasally tenors because that projects big Rudy Valley and, you know, swanee, swanee, these kinds of voices. And for females, it was like the operatic sopranos who could do that really big projection, the loud sounds that were able to be heard. But as soon as we get the ribbon mic, now the soft voices can be heard. And so Bing Crosby, he can get right up on the microphone. And can, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. 
and the ladies' hearts flutter and they swoon and he becomes this huge international celebrity and he's also a movie star and it doesn't hurt that he's considered really handsome. Uh, so yeah, the ribbon microphone gives us the ability to broadcast these faint voices. And then Orlando Marsh and the vacuum tube gives us the ability to record these faint sounds. Now all we need is a better recording medium. And so we already had the prototype of the wire recorder that Vladimir Poulsen came up with based on the ideas that Oberlin Smith published back in 1888 using a magnetic head to displace metallic shavings. But in Germany, a company called AEG has come up with the first tape recorder. And the United States didn't really know about this because it was used for German state purposes, and this is wartime, you remember. And so what's happening is there are these USGIs who are stationed in Germany and they're listening to German radio and they're hearing these speeches, these political speeches going on, right? And these speeches are longer than any recording medium we had in the United States could hold. And not only that, they sound like live broadcast, but they'll hear the same speech multiple times. And so they know that something's going on here. They're hearing that same identical speech. It's not just the same. It's not just someone reading it again. It's like they clear their throat in the same spaces. You can tell that this is a recording, but it sounds better than the recordings we were making. And so it's not until 1945, when the war ends, that this U.S. soldier named Jack Mullen, Jack Mullen, is in charge of uh, going through captured German radio stations and finding the technology. And he comes back to the U.S. with these two suitcases. And these suitcases contain the magnetophone. tape recorders. I mean, exactly the, the way we think of them today, they were built into this suitcase sort of device. And they were using the advances in amplification to take the output of these quality microphones, and Jeremy had the best microphones. I mean, a lot of our audio advancements in this era during sort of that creepy, you know, two world wars kind of German era, the government of Germany knew the value of propaganda, and so they weren't afraid to write big checks to audio companies to get the best sounding audio equipment. And some of our most lust worthy microphones and preamplifiers and such come out of advancements that were made for the sinister purposes of wartime Germany, which is a really <laughs> complicated thing to wrap our brains around, right? But that's what was happening. Okay, so the magnetophone shows up in the U.S. thanks to Jack Mullen. And Jack Mullen shows it to Bing Crosby, world-famous Bing Crosby. Jack Mullen shows it to a lot of people. He's proud, you can imagine. And it's sort of being toured around as, look at this amazing technology that we found, right? But Bing Crosby sees it and his brain instantly latches on to the idea. Because here's the thing. Bing Crosby hosts a daily radio show live. You know, think of it like The Tonight Show. And it is the most popular program on radio at the time when radio is the most popular form of entertainment in the world. And so Crosby sees the tape machine and he thinks, you know, if I had one of those... I could, because it can record long stretches, I could pre-record a week's worth of radio shows on Monday and then spend Tuesday through Sunday drunk on a golf course. And if there is anything Bing Crosby loves more than acting and singing and being famous and handsome, it is drinking. And he has that idea and he sees the potential 
And he latches onto it. He says, I need one of these. And he talks to his, his radio company, which is CBS. And he says, I want, I want this device. And they say, guess what? Your show is wildly popular. It's working exactly the way it is. So no. So Crosby says, fine, I'll do it myself. And he invests 50,000 of his own dollars. And we're talking 1940s dollars here. That is a small fortune. Crosby invests $50,000 into an electronics company called Ampex. And Ampex is the company that ends up sort of reverse engineering the magnetophone that Jack Mullen brings back from Germany. And Jack Mullen and Bing Crosby remain friends. And actually, Jack Mullen produces some of Bing Crosby's recordings after this and sort of acts as an early engineer, recording engineer in Crosby's studio. So there you have it. There you have those few changes in technology, amplification, ribbon microphones, and modern magnetic recording that truly make everything that is to follow possible. It's a pretty good story, but it's not over. So be sure to tune in next time when we talk about how that tape machine completely changes everything about recording and the music industry. Well, until then, it's time to bounce. This is me, Scott Velasco, fading out. See you next time.